Good morning, Chris Hall, Wake Forest School of Medicine, Infectious Diseases. It's been a while since we've talked um, about respiratory viruses, particularly COVID. Um, so I thought now would be a good time um, to give a bit of an update as we move into our respiratory viral season. So it's um, respiratory viral season, no different with COVID or without COVID in that uh, it comes um, usually by at the end of December and it strengthens up in January and goes through February and then by the time we get into March it's largely over. So with the addition of COVID, our respiratory viral season now includes three major viruses most of you have heard the name of. Um, first being respiratory syncytial, syncytial virus which now you know why we call it RSV because it's hard to say quickly uh, over and over. So RSV and then influenza, good old flu. Uh, and then now we have the addition of the coronavirus COVID-19. Um, and this respiratory viral season, all three are circulating. So as we uh, started to get into Christmas time and up until the new year, Fortunately, our numbers of RSV, which had been quite high and, um, and a bit of a problem, particularly in our pediatric and young population, started to fall. So it looks like RSV has now peaked and will be um, continuing to decline as we go through January. Influenza, however, is another story. Uh, and influenza is the big guy on the block right now. Uh, and our flu numbers continue to increase. Um, and they really didn't have their usual um, dip that we usually see right around Christmas time when schools go out. So I think for the next three or four weeks, flu is going to be giving us some trouble. Um, and right now, as far as hospitalizations go, in our region as well as in Charlotte uh, and across the country, actually flu is a bigger problem right now than COVID. That doesn't mean that COVID cases aren't occurring. Um, they are. Uh, our wastewater numbers, which is one of the better ways to track right now, are continuing to go up, including here in the triad. Uh, down in Charlotte, they're up actually even higher than they were during the July and August peak that we had at the end of la last summer, if you remember. Um, and uh, a lot of these infections are largely uh, colds, um, colds and flus. That doesn't mean you're not miserable. Um, headache, sore throat, um, cough, uh, fatigue. Um, but, um, uh, but thankfully, uh, not many people yet are getting hospitalized with COVID. Uh, and that's good news. So uh, as far as COVID goes, uh, we have a new kid on the block um, in the variants. So Variant alphabet soup time. This one is JN1, um, and it's a little easier to remember and say than the previous one, which was XBB 1.5. JN1 is a, is an Omicron variant, um, but it's uh, had some mutations compared to the Omicron that we saw two years ago in January, um, which has made it a bit more infectious, uh, but it also uh, seems to evade a little bit more immunity. Luckily, though, the fall COVID booster that some of us got last fall um, is seemed to be protective for JN1. So that's uh, good news with that variant. The other good news with this variant is it does not seem to be any more severe than our previous Omicron variants. And even in regions of the United States, such as New England, where they saw JN1 come up first, uh, we didn't really see much of an increase in hospitalizations due to that variant. So that's good news for those of us who work in the hospital and good news particularly for people who may have underlying diseases and that might be more susceptible to hospitalization due to COVID. So those are the three big respiratory viruses that are on the block right now. Uh, and uh, just to recap, COVID's going up fairly quickly and flu's going up fairly quickly but RSV fortunately is a bit on the decline. What does this mean for us? Well, uh, a few things. One is that um, we need to revisit a little bit um, how to test and how to isolate for these different viruses. So let's go through that very briefly. Um, so let's say you, um, you got home from work or Johnny came home from school, sore throat, bit of a headache, uh, maybe a fever, stuffy nose, some cough developing. How, what is it? 
Is it going to be the flu? Is it going to be COVID? Or is it one of the other cruddy respiratory viruses that normally cause colds? Well, the best way to find out is to test. And uh, you can now still get COVID tests, um, and they are available at most major pharmacies. There's still some free tests available, so if you search on the Internet, you can still find some free ones, although um, the free ones aren't as in large a supply as they had been a year ago. So you test yourself for COVID. Put the swab in the nose, stick it in the solution according to the package directions, wait your 15 minutes, and then if you get two blue lines, um, on the, then you have COVID. So you know what you have in that point, um, and you can follow through with the directions on what to do about COVID, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. If you have a fever with it, the, and the COVID test is negative, then you'll also want to think about testing for flu. There is an over-the-counter test now. It's starting to become available, uh, and you can test yourself for flu, or you can test yourself at an urgent care. Or now, with there's so much flu around, if your COVID test is negative, and you have a fever with your illness, you can just assume it's influenza. And then I'll tell you what to do about influenza here in a minute. If your COVID test is negative and you don't have a fever, then you might just have a common cold and you repeat your COVID test the next day just to make sure it's not COVID because sometimes the test will pop positive a day or so after um, the symptoms start. So just to recap, you got your cold symptoms, test for COVID. If you're negative and you have a fever, you can assume it's the flu. If you don't have a fever, um, you retest again the next day, and then if the COVID test is negative, you have a cold. Now, what do you do about those? Well, for COVID and flu, we have treatments, particularly people who are older or people who have underlying respiratory diseases or people who have underlying uh, illnesses um, that they see a doctor for, you likely want to get treated for COVID and the drug we use for that is Paxlovid. There are a few drug-drug interactions with Paxlovid, so you should have a pharmacist or a doctor when they make the prescription look at your other medications to make sure that there's not interference from other meds. And then you can get your prescription, and it can be done through a virtual visit or um, calling in, um, and uh, you pick it up from your pharmacy, and you take that medicine twice a day for five days. Most of the people that I know who've taken Paxlovid for COVID feel better fairly quickly. Usually within 24 to 48 hours, the symptoms um, are abating. So that's good news. Also good news with Paxlovid, if you have underlying medical problems or you're older, 85% chance it'll keep you out of the hospital. And that's important. You don't want to get hospitalized with your COVID, obviously. So Paxlovid for treatment of COVID. The treatment for flu is largely oseltamivir. Most people know by the trade name Tamiflu. There are some other drugs out now that are like oseltamivir or Tamiflu that can also be taken. That would also require a prescription from your doctor and a virtual visit or a telephone visit. You can pick that up from them. Anyone really could take Tamiflu um, for um, influenza. You don't have to be um, immunocompromised or older or have underlying diseases. Um, and it does abate symptoms um, by some extent, shaves a day or so off, and reduces the peak intensity of the symptoms. And it also importantly helps reduce spreading to other people. So that's Tamiflu or oseltamivir for influenza. RSV, unfortunately we don't really have a therapy for that right now. Um, and, um, and so you just have to write it out and all the other cold viruses, you write it out. Now, what about isolation? Remember back in the time of the, of the main um, um, pandemic emergency, we talked a lot about how long you had to isolate. First it was 14 days, and then we reduced it to 10 days, then we brought it down to five days, wearing a mask for the next five days afterwards. We're still at that point for COVID. So for COVID, you're still supposed to isolate for five days from the beginning of symptoms or from the date of your positive test if you're asymptomatic. 
that isn't the end of the world. Most people don't really feel like going out and about or going to work or school anyway when they're sick. So you stay home for your five days. And then after five days, you can go back to usual activities, go out and about, but you wear a mask for the next five days afterwards. So if you're going to school, you wear a mask. If you're going back to work, you wear a mask for the next five days. For influenza, it's a little bit simpler. If you test positive for the flu, or if your COVID test is negative and you have a fever and you're assuming it's the flu, stay home from work or school until you're 24 hours without fever, without taking acetaminophen, which is Tylenol or ibuprofen. So 24 hours without fever reducing medicines with no fever, and then you can go back to school or work. For the common cold, it's a little bit more common sense. Um, as soon as you're starting to feel better and the symptoms are abating, you can go back to work or school. You might want to be a good citizen and keep from spewing particles all over people, and you can wear a mask for a while until the major nose symptoms are gone from that. So that's what to do if you get um, a respiratory virus during our respiratory viral season here, and a lot of us will get one. Um, so what's going on out there right now with our schools in particular? If you remember during COVID, um, we were having outbreaks sometimes of COVID during schools. We tracked them fairly closely and we did contact tracing with that. We no longer do that. So it's largely a uh, responsibility of the parents or sometimes the school nurse now. Again, be a good citizen. If your child's sick with a respiratory virus, stay home and follow the isolation guidelines that we just talked about. Get tested for COVID, get tested for flu if you need to, or just assume that it's the flu if you have a fever and your COVID test is negative. And then stay home for the recommended isolation guidelines. Get in touch with your teacher, have the homework sent home. Um, some schools still have virtual options. A lot of them don't anymore, but some schools still do. Um, so, um, but it's a good, good to not go to school uh, when you're a child, when you're sick. Same thing with university students. Uh, you want to stay out of class, stick to your dorm room, um, and work it out with your roommate. A lot of uh, schools have guidelines for how um, to uh, stay in your room and have ways for you to get food delivered and so on and so forth uh, if you need to. And then for those of us um, who, um, who are in the workplace, um, find a virtual option, do it from home for a while if you feel well enough, uh, but let's keep from spreading our virus to others. Another thing that we can do during respiratory viral se season is to protect ourselves from getting infected in the first place. Who wants to get sick? Um, so here are some ways to do that. First, it is not too late to get vaccinated. Um, and for these three viruses, for COVID, for flu, and for RSV, we do have vaccine options. Um, so for COVID, um, a fall booster came out last fall. Uh, this booster still seems to be on target and protective, uh, particularly for severe illness, hospitalization uh, from COVID. I got my COVID uh, booster last fall. Knock on wood, so far so good. No COVID for Dr. Ohl. Uh, and I know a lot of other people who've gotten boosted who so far have dodged the COVID bullet. So uh, it is not too late to get that vaccine. The vaccine's available in pharmacies. It's available in some primary care offices here um, in the um, Wake Forest Baptist Health uh, Network. You can check with My Wake Health or check the webpage to find out where the COVID vaccine is available. Um, if you, uh, otherwise, you can get it from the pharmacy. The health department actually ran out of adult COVID vaccine a couple weeks ago. You may think, oh my God, but I think that's good news because that means we gave out roughly 5,000 doses to Forsyth County people, and I'm happy about that. They have a new order in, it's expected any day, so you can check with the webpage or with the health department. That vaccine is free. They still have uh, supplies of pediatric vaccine and anyone over the age of six months can get vaccinated for COVID. Um, and I would recommend that for children. It'll help keep them in school. It'll help keep them in daycare. Uh, and for parents, that means it'll help keep them out of your hair, so to speak, because they'll be at daycare or school. Um, 
Now, for um, flu, flu vaccine is still widely available. Luckily, the latest data that we have, it looks like on target for the H3N2 and the H1N1 strains of flu that are circulating. So go get vaccinated for flu. Both of these vaccines, COVID vaccine booster and flu vaccine, kick in within two weeks. And because I expect this respiratory virus season to last until at least mid-February, maybe even end of February, if you get it now, largely most of the season, you'll have pretty good protection from those two viruses. For RSV, it's a little bit different. The people we want to protect from RSV are our babies, particularly babies under the age of eight months. RSV infects the tiny little airways in the lung, so babies are tiny. If you have a tiny little airway and a tiny little baby and it gets inflamed, it's gonna close off. And that's why RSV is such a problem for young children. There is a, a, a vaccine of sorts. Technically, it doesn't induce active immunity, but it gives instantaneous passive immunity. And that's an immunoglobulin product made from a monoclonal antibody. And that's available, and pediatricians are highly recommending that for babies under the age of eight months, and certain children between the ages of eight months and two years. So if your baby hasn't been immunized or passively immunized for RSV, I think it's still a good idea to do that now um, to get us through the tail end of the RSV season here. So you'll want to talk to your pediatrician about doing that. For all the other colds and respiratory cruds out there, there's no vaccine. And the only way to protect is really by wearing a mask. A mask will protect you from all of these respiratory viruses, including COVID, flu, uh, and RSV. Where would a mask become important? Well, it's kind of common sense. It's where there might be a lot of other sick people around. So I don't know if you traveled over um, the Christmas holidays, uh, but the airport waiting rooms, great place to get a respiratory virus if you wanted one. Crowded, a lot of people, some people are traveling sick. Um, I, for one, would wear a mask. Uh, and I'm traveling next week and I plan on putting one on when I'm in the airport. Uh, and likely on the plane too, um, depending on how crowded it is. Other places, if you're going to see your doctor, even for if it's a routine primary care visit, waiting rooms in and around the clinic, obviously sick people go in to see their doctors uh, and you may be more likely to come across one. Some people are wearing them in grocery stores and other public places, particularly if you're immunocompromised at the extremes of age, like over the age of 65 or 70, um, or you have underlying medical problems, you may want to wear a mask as we go through respiratory viral season until we get out of it uh, at the end of February. Um, and masks would do work, um, despite all of the misinformation you may read and see. Uh, and that's why when I, as an infectious disease doctor, walk into a room of somebody who's got a respiratory virus or TB or measles or any one of these contagious diseases, I put on an N95 mask and guess what, I'm protected. Uh, so you can do the same thing um, as you go out and about. Lastly, um, do what your mom told you to do when you were a kid. Get plenty of sleep, eat well, um, maybe some chicken soup um, and um, keep yourself healthy otherwise not run down. Keep your immune system up and going um, and you're more likely to get through the season unscathed or if you do get infection. Uh, it'll be less likely to be severe uh, and um, you'll get better faster. So uh, a couple other appeals. So we in healthcare right now are pretty busy. Um, up here in the triad area, um, our urgent cares and our ED volumes are very high. In fact, just over this past week, our urgent care volume set records for the number of patients that we were seeing in Atrium Health Wake Forest Baptist. Um, so um, those virtual options that I talked about earlier, going through My Wake Health or going through the phone, is a great way um, if you have a mild illness of not um, over accessing or overburdening healthcare. If you have to go to the ED um, and, and you really need to go, expect to wait. Um, now for respiratory viruses, when do you need to go to the emergency room? Well, it's kind of common sense. It's when um, particularly if you have a lot of underlying health problems um, or are, are older, 
if you have shortness of breath, um, if you have weakness so that it's hard to get out and about and around the house, um, if uh, you get real dizzy standing up or dehydrated, um, if you have a very high fever with confusion, those are all reasons to go to the emergency department. Otherwise, it's kind of best to stay out of there right now. Um, our hospitals are tight. Um, we're not at a point where it's so tight that we have to cut back on normal services. In fact, we don't anticipate that to be the case this year. While our numbers of influenza in particular in the hospital are higher than they had been in previous years, um, and our COVID numbers are going up, they're not nearly to the point that they were last year or the year before when the Omicron surge happened. Um, and so we don't ha anticipate at all having to cut back on our normal services right now unless things really go uh, out the back door uh, as far as the season goes. Um, but um, we are keeping track of it uh, and we're having to do some shifts of where our pa patients and staffing are, uh, but it's not nearly as tight as it was during the previous years. So that's good news um, for those of us in the hospital. As far as our schools go, a little bit early to tell. Um, I anticipate that school absenteeism will start going up starting next week because we had viruses circulating during the Christmas and New Year's break. Uh, schools just for largely our public schools just started back this week, so it's a little bit early to know. Colleges and universities, most of them don't start back until next week or the following. Um, I anticipate it's going to be a tough year for student health uh, in universities. Um, because of dormitory spread of respiratory viruses. But I don't think it's going to be nearly the problem that it was in early emergencies uh, when we had the pandemic emergency, I mean. And I, I don't anticipate um, that it's going to result in uh, university or school shutdowns like we've had in the past. Um, so put all that together, COVID's largely becoming a virus that we see mostly in respiratory viral season. We always seem to have that little July, August, early September peak. I'm not so sure that's going to go away. But this is mostly going to be a January, February thing now as we slide that virus into the other pathogens that cause cold and flu. So with that, um, I'm going to talk a little bit. Oh, one last thing I want to mention. Um, a lot of hospitals right now have visitor restrictions, uh, including us with Atrium Health, Wake Forest Baptist, and also down in Charlotte area, so you want to check uh, your hospital's websites about their specific restrictions. Most of this includes not having visitors under the age of 12, um, and there's some variances of which hospitals where you have to wear masks and which ones you don't. So you can check your hospital's website for that. So let's go on to some uh, questions from my colleagues in the media. Um, and uh, by the way, I miss seeing all you guys uh, from the media. Uh, we used to have our weekly meeting and catch up what was going on in your life and your family's life and my life. Uh, so I kind of miss that. Um, in a way, um, not necessarily want to go back to those days of pandemic emergency, but I just wanted to give you guys all a shout out and thanks for doing everything you do. Uh, Dr. O, which is the most common uh, concern now? Which is the most concern locally about the different respiratory viruses? And when do I think the peak will come to the flu? Well, what, which virus is a concern depends a little bit on who you are. If you're a baby under the age of eight months, um, you probably aren't watching this, but your parents might be, RSV is still the biggest one to be concerned about because that's the one that's most likely going to land you in the hospital. And again, talk to your pediatrician about whether or not you should get passive immunization for uh, if you're under the age of eight months. If you're older or have a lot of underlying medical problems, right now the big one is flu. And you need to make sure you've gotten your flu vaccine this year. Um, for others, COVID is starting to come up. I think peak will f the peak for flu will probably hit towards the end of January. So always will be in a little bit of a, of a fortune teller here, but I think towards the end of January. And I bet you what's going to happen is, is as flu starts to come down, COVID will come up. Because there always, there's some funny relationship between these two viruses where they don't like being in the same room with each other. And so when flu is high, COVID's a little lower. 
So I, I'm guessing that within three to four weeks we'll peak for flu, um, and then uh, but COVID will be a problem um, until the end uh, of February. Um, and for uh, the COVID uh, is mostly a problem for uh, people over the age of 65 to 70 or those underlying medical problems or those who are immunocompromised. Um, uh, I got a question. Any signs of flu COVID combo cases locally? You know, I, we don't really keep that data as how many people get flu and COVID at the same time. Um, I, I do have information from early in the pandemic, mostly on the West Coast, when we were doing a lot of um, invasive testing of, for people with COVID because we didn't understand the virus as much then. So we were doing more um, fiber optic examinations of the lungs and getting specimens. And back early in the pandemic, up to about um, maybe somewhere between 10 to 15 percent of people were having both flu and COVID at the same time. Um, I, I suspect that's no longer true for a lot of reasons. Um, one is, is that um, COVID isn't nearly um, as, um, as big of a problem as it was early in the pandemic as far as kinds causing severe illness. Um, and the other is that um, there's just not as much of it circulating now as then. So I'm guessing maybe around 5% of people might have both. And I can tell you symptom-wise, the one that's going to be more predominant for you is probably going to be influenza. So the headache, the bad body aches, the I just don't want to get out of bed, um, that's pretty prominent with influenza. Um, and if you get tested for COVID and it's positive, it may be that COVID's just along for the ride, hanging out in the back seat while flu is driving the, your main symptoms. So one of our school reporters wants to know uh, what we're seeing with the K through 12 schools and, and what we're circulating. Um, and, and I can tell you that in school age kids um, over the break, the big one was influenza um, and the flu. Um, again, a little bit earlier to know what's actually circulating in the school buildings itself. Um, we'll know more about that next week. Um, but um, school age kids, um, the last two, two weeks or so, it's been influenza or the flu. Um, and, um, and it's uh, kept them from, from enjoying some of the holidays, unfortunately. How long will this season last? We talked about usually our respiratory viral season goes it's roughly until about the end of February. As we get into mid-February and the daffodils start to peak out, um, um, our virus numbers start to decline, but we consider the season until the end of February. Um, and we talked about precautions residents can take during this time, um, and uh, I don't think we need to go over that again. Um, and we talked about when to go to the doctor's office and when not to, um, and so I won't go over that again. Um, why is this year different from others in regards to these three viruses? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, I'm not sure how different this year is. Um, there's a few things that are obviously different. Um, up until um, 2020, we didn't have COVID. So if you go back to respiratory viral season uh, before February of 2020, COVID wasn't um, a player. Um, but flu and RSV certainly were. Uh, RSV usually comes up in um, late October, November, uh, it peaks a little bit earlier than flu um, as flu gets going in late December, January, and February. Uh, and that seems to be what's happening this year. So for those two viruses, it seems to be more of a pre-pandemic normal for those two viruses. Um, but obviously, largely, the big elephant in the room here is we have the addition to, of COVID. Um, our numbers of RSV um, have been just as high in the past. In fact, our RSV numbers this year were lower than they were last year um, by maybe, maybe they were about 75-80% uh, of what they were last year. So our RSV season wasn't quite as bad as last year. Um, but I, I think mostly is that we just talk about it more. We test for these viruses a lot more frequently. They're easier to get in the doctor's office um, and they're readily available 
Um, so uh, we have wastewater numbers for COVID, so we know how much is going around. Whereas in the, the quote, good old days, it always used to be just cold and flu season, and we just left it at that. This year, and we know a little bit more about the specifics of it. Um, and not, not to sell s flu short, but you know, every, every year, even in the pre-pandemic era, we had 10 to 20,000 deaths across the U.S. due to the flu. So um, 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 we don't anticipate that being any different this year. Get your flu vaccine. <clears throat> um, so many people have been tested negative for all three. Could there be a, a new virus on the rise, but with the degree of COVID? No, I don't. I don't really think there is a new virus on the rise. Um, a, a couple things to talk about, though. Um, I, more last fall, the media was hung up about cases of respiratory infections that they were seeing um, in China, and then some places here in the United States, um, and including in Ohio. And these were largely quote walking pneumonia, people who didn't get hospitalized with it. Um, but might have had um, mild to mild pneumonia, so um, walking pneumonia is the lay term for that. So the one of the the it's actually a bacteria that can cause walking pneumonia is mycoplasma. Sorry to hit you with a new a new term, but so mycoplasma cycles um, every few years, maybe five to six years, we get a cycle of mycoplasma that comes through. A population, and those cases that we heard about last fall in the early winter turned out to be mycoplasma, and that's nothing new or different. It's easily treatable, uh, and it very rarely results in hospitalization. Um, and that was what was going on then. Uh, right now, mycoplasma is kind of uh, not as much of an issue, um, but we, um, uh, with the the three viruses that we're seeing now. Um, if you test negative for COVID and you test negative for flu, you got one of the other cold viruses. And, and I'm not going to give you the long, boring list of the other viruses um, that can cause colds. But if you want to remember one that's easy to remember, you can remember rhinovirus. Rhino, nose, rhino, rhinoceros, right? The big nose in the front of that animal. So rhino means nose. And rhinovirus... Uh, is also uh, goes around. That one tends to go around a lot during the year. So if you don't have COVID and you don't have flu, um, you'll likely have one of these other standard cold viruses like rhinovirus. But I don't see any new pandemic virus right now. Um, there's no indications that there are any in the world anywhere right now. Um, someday we'll probably have another pandemic, but someday could be decades off. Um, but and we need to keep an eye on it, but no indication of that right now. So uh, I don't know if there are any other questions that came up through social media. Um, one person asked that they missed the fall booster and ended up getting COVID at Thanksgiving. Is there a time frame that they should still get the booster? Right, good question. Is there a time frame? So if you got, if you got COVID last, um, usually it was September or last fall sometime, um, August and September, we had a fair number of people get it. Um, so if you got COVID then, how long should you uh, wait before getting the booster? Well, you got some immunity from that, um, even though that was an XBB variant, not the JN1. So um, the time frame to wait for, for four months after you had the last COVID. If it's been more than four months, you can go get the booster. Do any of the other viruses affect taste? Do any of the other viruses affect taste or smell? That's another good question. Not much. No, COVID's pretty much the taste and smell one. Um, and that, if you remember early on in the pandemic, was kind of a surprise. It was a surprise to me as an infectious disease doc because uh, most of our other respiratory viruses don't do that. Now, if you get a cold and you get your old nose all plugged up with mucus and stuff, um, kind of gross, but... Um, Obviously, you can block your smell receptors that way. But neurologically, the only one that affects taste and smell is COVID. 
Um, and uh, some interesting points about that. Um, it doesn't seem to be uh, happening as much now as it did earlier in the pandemic. So with the Omicron subvariants, that particular symptom is not as predominant as it was earlier. It still happens. Um, and I, I know a lot of the people I know who've gotten COVID, they got it in July and August would talk about it, um, that they had loss of taste and smell. But it doesn't seem to be as much of a problem as it was early on, which is good, particularly if you're a chef. Um, the other thing that's a little different now is there's not as much asymptomatic shedding. Because if you remember back early in the pandemic, we talked about that particularly household contacts of people of symptomatic COVID, if you go through and test that household, 30 to 40% of them would have COVID in their nose and would be shedding um, and would not have symptoms. That number seems to be less than 10% now. Not quite as robust data because we haven't really done huge studies with it. But that seems to be less likely. And that's one of the reasons that we're really not thinking about doing widespread masking like we did during the COVID outbreak uh, pandemic um, because asymptomatic shedding just isn't as much of a problem as it used to be. Other questions? All right, very good. Glad to be back uh, for our respiratory virus season. Let's uh, stay healthy uh, and happy. Uh, and the next big holiday to look forward to, Valentine's Day. Right. And then we have spring break. Daffodils will be up. Trees will be flowering. Winter will be over, hopefully. So stay safe.